Final item of business today is a member's business debate on motion number 11849 in the name of Alex Johnson on new psychoactive substances need assessment for Tayside 2014 report. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put and I'd invite those members who wish to speak in the debate to please press the request to speak buttons now or as soon as possible. And I call on Alex Johnson, Mr Johnson, seven minutes to open the debate, please. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. The life of an MSP rarely goes quiet. But if there's one time of year when people have better things to think of, it's between Christmas and New Year. And that's why last year I was surprised to receive uh, an urgent call in that period. And it was as a result of that that I found myself attending a packed public meeting in our broth. The purpose of the meeting was uh, organised by local uh, community activists was to highlight the concerns about new psychoactive substances, the so-called legal highs, which were being used, especially among young people in the area. One of the major concerns was not just that these poten the potential effects of these products, but the fact that they were so readily available in a number of retail premises in the town. Since that meeting, things have come a long way. A campaign group was formed in Arbroath, followed by others in Montrose and Aberdeen. These groups decided to work together, harnessing social media, and subsequently joined with other similar groups south of the border. It's an ongoing and constantly evolving problem. The manufacturers can quickly change the chemical makeup of these products, meaning that they are always one step ahead of the law. The actual effects of these substances, and indeed the prevalence in our communities, can be hard to pin down. That's why this needs assessment for Tayside 2014 and the large-scale survey on which it's based are such a welcome contribution to the ongoing debate on this very serious issue. Non new psychoactive substances are designed to, or are claimed, to mimic the effects of already existing illegal drugs. The range of adverse effects of taking these substances can include palpitations, agitation, vomiting, seizures, headache, chest pain, insomnia, sweating, vomiting, hypertension and delusions. Worse still, the NHS Tayside report states that users have experienced mental health impacts such as paranoia, anxiety and psychotic symptoms while under the influence of these substances. A worrying long-term issue is that users have reported dependency developing while on NPS, tolerance of these substances and withdrawal symptoms. As is so often the case, the effects can also make users vulnerable when they become confused and lacking in self-awareness. With such a wide range of deeply concerning effects, these products may well find, uh, many may find it astonishing that they can be purchased from retail premises in our towns. This gives the substances a veneer of legality which masks the potentially appalling results of their consumption. They are sometimes sold as plant food, sometimes as bath salts or even incense. Yet too often, toxicology tests show that they can contain a cocktail of potentially harmful substances, some of which might already be illegal under the Misuse of Drugs Act, leaving the purchaser and the seller open to legal action and a criminal record. Oh, if only it happened more often. Of course, there are also knock-on effects on public resources. When things go wrong, according to the report, in, many, um, in the majority of instances, assistance was sought from the Scottish Ambulance Service, where the number of incidents involving NPS has increased consistently from January 2012 onwards. And, as we know, help is also regularly sought from accident, accident and emergency departments, GPs and mental health services. Excuse me a moment, papers sticking together. The growing awareness of the dangers of these substances is to be welcomed, but clearly there remains much to be done. Opportunities exist to examine the reporting methods of incidents where these substances are suspected to have been taken, 
uh, also to look at ways users or potential users can be educated about the risks they are taking and to keep reviewing how organisations such as the Scottish and UK governments, Police Scotland and the NHS work alongside key partners to maximise awareness of just how dangerous these substances are until such time as the legal loopholes are closed and it's finally made illegal to sell them. I find it reassuring that the results of this survey are not only reflected in discussions with professionals and community groups, they also very much reflect what I was first told at that meeting over a year ago and have consistently been told since. There was an expressed wish in the survey for additional help and support to be available to those who take NPS uh, by most, resident, most respondents to the survey. The majority wanted there to be raised awareness of the dangers of and potential damage associated with NPS, with emphasis on the requirement for greater education. Respondents also wanted to see greater availability of support services for NPS use, with some suggesting readily accessible drop-in services or a dedicated NPS service. There was also, uh, uh, indeed I can, but I thank the member very much indeed for, for giving way in his opening speech. Um, he said he was looking to a point where it would become illegal to sell them. Is he suggesting a more robust licensing system at local authority level? Alex Johnson. I think, uh, as you, the member will be aware, it's not appropriate for me to make requirements of government during a speech in a member's debate. But I believe it is important that the UK and the Scottish Government move forward together to ensure that each government, each parliament, can take through legislation to deal with those areas for which they are responsible. That includes uh, act, uh, action by the Westminster Parliament to make these substances illegal where that is possible, but also action through this parliament which will enable local authorities and police forces to take greater action on the ground to close down these shops that have been identified. In conclusion, presiding officer, I would very much like to pay tribute to the grassroots and community campaigns that sprang up in response to this growing concern. Their voices have been heard loud and clear, and they continue to move towards their ultimate goal of closing these head shops and banning the so-called legal highs they sell, making sure that they get them off the streets. I welcome this report, and I see it as being hugely influential in the campaign and I commend the authors and those who took part in the survey for the work they have done. I move the motion in my name. Many thanks. And I now call on Graham Day to be followed by Anne McTaggart. Four minute speeches are there by, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, the NPS needs assessment for Tayside report makes informative reading, and I commend Alec Johnson for bringing it before the Chamber for debate. It would be impossible to cover every relevant aspect of the report in four minutes. So I want to focus on ease of access to NPS and what's been done to disrupt that in the part of Tayside which I represent. Although there are 650 websites across Europe selling NPS, the report indicated that not only did most people first experience these products either through friends or so-called head shops, ongoing supply after that introduction was predominantly through shops. Accessing NPS directly from shops in the first instance rather than the internet was by a margin of six to one. The ratio when it came to subsequent ongoing uses is around four to one. And there's painful real life experience to support this. Uh, Angus woman Laura Mackay, who lost her brother Michael to NPS abuse last year, made a very telling and touching contribution to a recent newspaper article on the subject. Um, Refusing suggestions that head shops are doing nothing other than providing the same service as is available online, she made the extremely valid point that if people want NPS, they aren't going to wait for an internet delivery if there's a readily available supply close at hand. The report highlighted the influence of the presence of head shops in our communities, revealing a widely held view over the role that ready access plays in NPS and the techniques used by these premises to encourage purchasing. It specifically suggests that the fact so-called legal highs can be purchased from shops gives a legitimacy, uh, legitimacy to them. Interestingly, it says that there's an apparently, and I quote, strong appetite amongst NPS users and people who know users to ban head shops, reasoning that by removing them from our midst, temptation would be reduced. And they undoubtedly a point, as of the 34 NPS seized by Police Scotland across Tayside, 
Between May and July of last year, 21 are known to have been purchased from one of seven head shops that were operating within the region at that time. The good news is that we are seeing some of these premises leaving our communities. Although the Montrose premises in Nigel Dawn's constituency remains open, both shops in our borough have closed their doors. And, Presiding Officer, that is down in no small measure to the work of Police Scotland. This is a hugely challenging area for the police to deal with. In the absence of tried and tested paths to deal with those who bring these substances into their communities, they're having to think out of the box, and they're doing just that. Around a year ago, I, I was, as the local MSP, allowed to sit in on a Police Scotland mini-conference in our broad, at which officers from Strathclyde met up with colleagues from Angus to compare approaches to the problem. What struck me most about what I heard, and indeed the answers I, I received to the questions I posed, was the determination of officers to tackle this matter head on. And in that regard, can I commend absolutely the action taken in early 2014 by local officers under the command of Chief Inspector Gordon Mill in seizing more than £2,600 in cash from the owner of a shop selling NPS in our broad. Those officers took that action with no certainty of being backed up by the full force of the law. It was therefore heartening for, for them, and surely to be welcomed by this chamber, that the Crown Office supported seizure under the uh, Proceeds of Crime Act, and forfeiture was subsequently granted, setting a positive precedent, and one which proved to be more than just a shot across the bows for those peddling so-called legal highs. For the head shop in question has now followed another which was set up in our broad and closed its doors. Presiding officer, this chamber all too often hears criticism levelled at Police Scotland and their approach to certain issues. I hope on this occasion we can, connect, uh, can unite in commending the efforts of Police Scotland and Angus in seeking to rid our communities of ready access to NPS and support absolutely Chief Inspector Milne when he told the Arbroath Herald newspaper just before Christmas the supply of these substances from shops in our towns and in ways which entice young and vulnerable people to experiment and consume is morally reprehensible and should be stopped. The seizure of that money has attracted media coverage, but it's only the tip of the iceberg as far as the work being done by the police, along with the Procurator Fiscal and Training Standards in the area of Scotland that I, Nigel Don, Alec Johnson, Alison McInnes and Jenny Mara represent. Much of what's going on, uh, as with the shaping of potential future approaches to making life, if not impossible, then at least extremely uncomfortable for the traders in NPS, understandably takes place away from the public gaze. But I understand an individual from Angus has recently been charged with eight counts relating to the trafficking of NPS, which, if the case proceeds to trial and ends in conviction, will surely send the strongest possible deterrent message to those who are peddling NPS within our communities. And I'm sure members from across the chamber will be watching how that situation unfolds with interest. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I now call on Anne McTaggart to be followed by Alison McInnes. Thank you. Officer, I'm particularly pleased to participate in this members debate on the report produced by the NHST side into new psychoactive substances due to the fact that I previously worked in and around the area of addiction services and I thank Alec Johnson for securing tonight's debate. Although there is much media and political interest and in the new psychoactive substances, currently there is very little robust data on prevalence or patterns of use, making it difficult to access the level of need for health prevention interventions. Even though I do try um, and keep myself up to date on the area of addictions, it wasn't until um, a meeting in the cross-party group in drugs and alcohol in this place invited agencies, including um, a Glasgow consultant specialising in the area of NPS and its treatment, now, presiding officer, that was um, pretty horrific, to say the least. Um, he gave blow by blow account um, on his day-to-day -day work with some of the young people that had been involved um, and, and came to his hospital for treatment. Not only was it traumatising for the young people, um, but, and often, sometimes um, led to death, but also for their parents to be watching that, them going through that process. However, President Officer, the appearance of novel substances is not new, and until 2009, most NPS emerged that were typically sold on the illicit market and was an area of limited significance. The open sale of NPS marked the start of what is now called the legal highs market. This was facilitated by advances in technology and globalisation. The internet provides a platform for information and wide availability of NPS, which combined with ease of distribution and delivery has also a significant impact. 
These factors, together with changes in the price, the purity and the availability of similar traditional illicit drugs, created a perfect storm for the MPS market to establish itself both in Scotland and in the UK. The range and rate at which new substances appear means that we need to understand and respond differently than what we have done in the past. NPS are designed and produced to mimic the effects of illegal drugs such as cocaine, cannabis and ecstasy. Albeit that they are created so that their chemical structure is different and as to avoid being controlled under the current legislation. In the, in the last five years, since the introduction of European Wide commenced, the number of new psychoactive drugs has continued to grow. The pattern for use in Scotland is much higher than among our European counterparts. There is very little robust data on the prevalence of NPS in Scotland. However, according to the National Records of Scotland, there were 581 drug deaths in Scotland. The report produced by NHS Tayside into new psychiatric psycho psychoactive, I'd be as well just saying NPS, mm -hmm. in 2013, found that NPS was to be a potential contributor to 60 drug deaths in Scotland. Legal highs will become an even greater problem in the future. Therefore, the Scottish Government needs to take steps to establish a clear message in our schools and among the wider public of the dangers of MPS. MPS has also implications which result in the cost to the society. The total economic and social cost of illicit drug use in Scotland was estimated in 2006 to be just under 3.5 billion per year, with heroin holding the largest share of the market. In conclusion, presiding officer, new thinking and a, a refreshed approach to this issue are timely, and I hope my colleagues will join me in commending the work of the community groups and agencies, support agencies, which raise awareness of the potential dangers of NPS. Thank you. Any thanks? And I now call on Alison McInnes to be followed by Nigel Dodd. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, I too am grateful to Alex Johnson for bringing forward this important issue to the Chamber and for the work that he's done on this matter. Uh, comparatively little is known about the use, impact and perceptions of new psychoactive substances or NPS. And that's why research such as the comprehensive assessment by NHS Tayside compiled on behalf of the three local alcohol and drugs partnerships, is so valuable. I was impressed that it drew upon the expertise of professionals, sought the insight of community groups, and collected some 700 survey responses, one of the largest such exercises ever conducted by the Public Health Department at NHS Tayside. And engaging with 120 people with direct experience of using NPS is particularly worthwhile and illuminating. Their experience and perspective is essential to developing evidence-based responses. The report will assist in monitoring local trends and identifying appropriate harm reduction messages and measures. Other members have already highlighted some of its most significant observations. For example, that people are most commonly introduced to NPS between the ages of 16 and 19 that almost 60% of these people would always take these substances alongside others, uh, from alcohol to cocaine, and that many have sought emergency medical help for acute mental and physical symptoms associated with NPS use, symptoms such as psychosis, paranoia and seizures. I was also interested to read in the report that there was a strong appetite for so-called head shops to be banned, both amongst customers and the wider public, as Graham Day said, believing it could reduce temptation. This reflects the views of a number of my constituents who are troubled by the emergence of these shops on their high streets. As the public face of an otherwise shadowy international industry, shops in my northeast region in Aberdeen, Arbroath and Montrose have understandably attracted attention and been the focus of significant public concern. They are unmistakable. One even opened just a couple of doors down from St Andrew's Church drop-in centre for people contending with alcohol and drug addiction. So this, that led last year to the formation of campaign groups such as Arbroath and Montrose against legal highs. Indeed, people across Scotland are understandably asking how retail premises can openly display drugs paraphernalia and sell untested psychoactive substances. Despite the professional looking packaging, those buying NPS are often oblivious to their legality, strength, purity and effect. Just because they're sold as legal doesn't mean that they're safe. 
but Police Scotland advised that analysis of drug-related deaths in Scotland in 2013 revealed that NPS were found to be present in the person's body in 113 cases. And NPS were found to have been implicated in the person's death in 60 of those cases, as Anne McTaggart mentioned earlier. Premises in Tayside were recently investigated by the police as part of Operation Carinate, a local response to the trafficking, distribution and consumption of NPS. This led, as, as we've heard earlier, to thousands of pounds being forfeited under the Proceeds of Crime Act. And the Evening Telegraph reported yesterday that the owner of three shops has said it's unlikely he will continue to sell new psychoactive substances. I'm sure my constituents will welcome this news and it's testament to their determined campaigning and coordinated action and the determination of the police to take action on this. Indeed, the assessment and recent events in Tayside proves the importance of local partnerships. A multi-agency approach to NPS involving the police, the Crown Office, health services and local authorities and trading standards. But my constituents are also looking to both of Scotland's governments to ensure the law is effective in the face of this new, reckless and volatile industry. That's why I'm pleased that Liberal Democrats in the UK government recently led a review of NPS and also that the Scottish Government has identified the issue as a ministerial priority. In developing practical, sustainable NPS policy, we must listen to communities and frontline professionals, from health workers to youth workers. I think that's the only way to ensure that they have the tools they need to bring about change and improve early intervention, education and enforcement. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And thank you very much. And I now call on Nigel Dawn to be followed by Jenny Mara. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. And I do want to thank Alex, uh, uh, sorry, Alex Johnson for, for bringing this debate uh, to us. It's extremely important and it's timely. I noticed that the previous uh, debate on this subject, which was on the 6th of February last year, um, we were to some extent floundering with the lack of information. And, and the two reports which I have in my hand now and which members will have consulted have, of course, significantly informed us over the period, which is very useful in its own, its own terms. Uh, as members have already commented, uh, much of the information in there is extremely useful. Um, but one of the major errors, I guess, is that most of the information that we have is second-hand. And, and, and that's an important aspect of researching anything. Um, but I have to say that I, I did notice with some uh, pleasure that uh, Hot Chocolate Trust, for example, had actually provided some of the information in Dundee. And can I say, as a, as a former trustee of that organisation, I think they're very well placed to know what their clients are saying and would pass it on very well. So I think a lot, whilst it's all, a lot of it is second hand, much of it should be treated with considerable respect and, I, and, and I'm very happy to do so. Um, I note, as others have previously commented, that uh, uh, most people's first-hand experience uh, or first experience of using these kind of drugs is actually from friends or shops. And that's why it's extraordinarily important that we get rid of these shops. And I'm therefore very pleased that active uh, groups across our constituencies, and I refer particularly to Montrose, have been trying to, to highlight this as an issue. Um, I have to say that we know these things can be dangerous. But it's only when you've actually got somebody in front of you, and I remember the experience of the, of the man from Aberdeen telling me about how his partner had become deluded, delusional, totally addicted to these drugs and had subsequently died in dreadful circumstances. It's only when you get that kind of experience that it really means something to you as a listener, to me. And I'm very conscious that that's what we must do if the youngsters within our communities are to be dissuaded and it's that first-hand experience, that education, which I think is the most important thing that we can conceivably do. I don't know how we do it, but that's what would really work. Um, I'm very grateful to, to Graham Day for all that he said about the police. I do commend the work they're doing, and, and uh, Graham has taken us through that. My own conversations with the police have indicated that they're, they're going to crack this. They are absolutely determined to do what they can to protect our communities, and I'm equally clear that our communities want them to... Uh, deal with this. Restricting the supply seems to be the other thing apart from good information and education to our constituents. And there's a real difficulty there which some have referred to about online sales. Um, and this of course is going to cause us a problem. It already does but it will continue to cause us a problem. 
And I'd like briefly, presiding officer, to address the legislative approaches which the government might come up with. Because I think the thing that we need to make clear, and I'm grateful to other members for what they've already said, is that this is not an easy legislative area. Now, there was an expert panel group, and I commend the report published in September. It's published by the Home Office. This is a UK-wide uh, debate. And they looked at various ways in which we could do this. And I'd like to just briefly put them on the record, partly because it might help the minister in his summing up. You can try and ban analogues, which are chemicals which look roughly the same. You can also try and legislate for neurochemical equivalents. Now, there's some good chemistry in here where you can pick up parts of the chemical which seem to have the right effect on identified bits of the brains. And that can be done by genuine, clever organic chemistry. But again, you're only banning a particular area or a group of chemicals, a particular area of the problem. And the mere trouble that I'm having describing that tells you how difficult it's going to be to get the chemistry right and define it in any terms that lawyers are going to be able to cope with, never mind courts. The third approach outlined in here is the general prohibition, which essentially says if it's anything like this kind of chemical and it's sold for have that kind of effect, then we can probably assume it's bad and we really ought to ban it. That actually is quite a good approach and was what I think the, the, the group commended. Um, but the difficulty with that is actually not the way that British legal systems, the English and the Scottish legal systems, work. You can go for full regulation, which is what we do with current drugs. Uh, New Zealand have tried this. I think their story suggests that might not be the, uh, the best approach. And restricted availability is very much what least. we would want to recommend. So the police, I'm quite sure, are to be commended for what they're doing. Community activists are very much to be commended. Communities want to see these things out of the high street. We must do absolutely everything we can. But I think we must just be careful, as I conclude, presiding officer, not to imagine that there's some easel, easy legal fix. Just ban them. Sounds very easy. It ain't going to work. It really is enormously complicated. Thank you. Thanks very much. I now call on Jenny Mara, after which we'll move to the closing speech from the Minister. President Officer, I'd, li I'd like to make a very short contribution because I think most of the substantive issues um, have already been covered uh, by colleagues this afternoon. And I very much agree with the note that Nigel Dawn finished on, that there is no uh, easy uh, solution to this and legal and, uh, and legality might not uh, necessarily be the answer. I went yesterday to a shop in Dundee to see for myself how attractively packaged these legal highs are, um, because I find this issue extremely worrying. Worrying for, for young people, we know that 16 to 19 year olds are particularly attracted to, to try these substances. But, presiding officer, I think it's particularly worrying for parents as well because they know that perhaps um, the whole um, tag of legal highs gives an implication that these things are legal, acceptable, and perhaps even safe. And we all know that the reality that they are not. So I'm not saying that I'm coming to the chamber today with any hard answers, but I hope we can maybe look uh, very carefully at this over the next few weeks so we don't have the same debate next new year and haven't moved any further forward in this. One thing I would like to suggest, and I think we um, released something just uh, in the Christmas period on this, is a more robust system of reporting in our National Health Service. I do understand that there is no reporting system in place so that health boards have to report the number of uh, cases that are presented to hospitals that are a result of um, abuse or, or taking of these legal highs. And I wonder if that is something that we can uh, perhaps put in place so that we at least have the data in Scotland that shows what has been presented to our hospitals so that we can have the evidence and then start to identify preventative measures. Thank you. Thank you very much. I now call on the Minister, Paul Wheelhouse, to close the debate on behalf of the Government. Mr Wheelhouse, seven minutes or thereby, please. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. I am grateful for the opportunity to close this debate today, as it's the first such uh, opportunity I've had, in fact, uh, since taking up my new post to reply on behalf of the Government, and to do so in a matter of such importance and indeed significance. And I'll, I'll thank Alex Johnson again, but I thank him at this point for bringing the subject to, uh, to the Chamber today. While I couldn't participate in debate on NPS in February last year, uh, I am aware there was much agreement that NPS 
or as they are often inappropriately referred to, legal highs, present a real challenge to us, not just in terms of enforcement and the legality or otherwise has been referred to by Jenny Mara, but also the need to educate and to design services that respond swiftly uh, to the growing array of products that are available. It's a fundamentally important point when people refer to NPS as legal highs to remind those who are not expert in this field, and I count myself among those up until I got this position, um, that NPS cannot and should not be sold for human consumption. They may pose real risks to anyone who consumes them, and uh, Alice John has set out some very detailed points about the kind of health risks that may, they may pose. And only time will tell as to the, how significant the long-term health risks will be of consuming these products. Albeit the motion sets out, indeed, some very worrying statistics uh, echoed by Alison McInnes uh, and others uh, of their association with fatalities to date and the trauma this causes for their relatives, to the relatives that Graham Day and Nigel Dawn have referred to and, indeed, others. I'm grateful to Alex Johnson uh, for bringing this motion today and recognise the efforts that are being made in his local area. Uh, I'm also grateful to other members who have spoken today, notably Graham Day, the, the constituency member for Angus South, for support for Police Scotland and Trading Standards officers' efforts to clamp down on what they have perceived to be reckless conduct on the part of those selling NPS. I very much do welcome that, and uh, I know other members in the Chamber have echoed that today as well. Last year, my predecessor, Rosanna Cunningham, asked all ADPs uh, to continue to make an, uh, new psychoactive substances a priority for the areas, considering the needs of the area and planning and delivering services to respond to this. And I am delighted that NHS Tayside have picked up the ball and have undertaken a needs assessment of an acknowledged a considerable concern that these substances are causing to local communities there and elsewhere. And I think this point was specifically reflected in Alison McInnes' uh, remarks and those of Graham Day and Alex Johnston and, and reflect the testimonies of families who have sadly had relatives killed by NPS. And I very much want to commend the efforts of those, the range of local partners in our Broth and Montrose who have shown real leadership on the issue and have developed a strong partnership to consider the range of legal and other remedies available to restrict the sale and supply of NPS. I was encouraged to read in Saturday's uh, Courier of the closure of the head shop in Arbroath, which has been a result of uh, the strong partnership approach. And uh, this is a significant uh, development and shows what can be achieved when partners such as Police Scotland, Trading Standards Officers and local communities work together. And I know similar partnership success has been achieved in South Ayrshire previously, the first area indeed to secure the closure of a, a head shop in the circumstances. And the expert legal group commissioned by Rosanna Cunningham has visited the Tayside area and spoken firsthand to those on ground uh, to better understand the limitations and opportunities presented by current reserved and devolved law. And I am grateful to local stakeholders for supporting the work of the expert legal group in this way. The expert group were struck by the strong partnership of the local authority, the police, treatment services and schools, all pulling together a comprehensive approach, echoing the remarks of many across the chamber. And I'm expecting to receive the report of the legal group later this month, and I've already met them just before Christmas to discuss the progress they are making with their, uh, their work. The report is being informed by the publication of the UK Government's own review into NPS, and I will be looking to engage with Home Office Ministers in the coming weeks to discuss how we can cooperate further in delivering on this agenda. In addition to this legal work, I would take the opportunity to remind colleagues across the Chamber that the Scottish Government has been leading some thinking at a, a national level about how better we can understand the who and the what of NPS and develop an evidence base to ensure our policy response is proportionate and targeted. And in August, we published a summary of evidence to date and brought together a group of informed experts drawn from different fields to examine the trends in use, uh, data being collected and what evidential gaps remain. And I'm currently considering the recommendations from this group and hope this addresses Nigel Dawn's concerns regarding the need for more data, uh, sort of first-hand data to be available. And uh, maybe in due course, we are studying, I should point out, the approach taken in Wales at this time to see what relevance it may have to Scotland. So I give them undertaking to Jenny Mara. That's something we are looking at and we'll obviously take on board any messages that come from that. However, our, report, uh, our work to support prevention and education continues. And I recently uh, visited Crewe in Edinburgh, uh, who I note have supplied a useful briefing for MSPs in advance of uh, today's debate to see the prevention and messaging work that we support and to aid my own understanding of NPS issues. And I found the visit uh, particularly helpful and was struck about the dominance of NPS stimulants and cannabinoids uh, use in the Edinburgh area and their strength and how they are often used alongside illicit drugs in a cocktail uh, of substances that people are taking. Uh, also alcohol, of course, can be an exacerbating factor. What also worried me was the emerging evidence that some are using NPS intravenously, exposing themselves to the risk of blood-borne diseases and indeed amputations to add to the long list that Alex Johnson set out today. And our continued funding 
for the web-based Know the Score and the schools-based Choices for Life programme are a vital part of the national contribution. I was greatly impressed uh, by what I saw at the studio in East Kilbride, uh, the Choices for Life studio, and I welcome the fact that the Choices team are hoping to be in a position to broadcast a powerful new NPS themed video over GLOW, uh, the uh, network used to, to educate children uh, from spring onwards. And hopefully that addresses the point that Anne McTaggart was looking for more support in terms of education uh, resources to help inform young people of the risks of using NPS. I am struck by the level of political consensus to the issue of NPS, both today and in February, and I am giving some consideration as to how I might build on this consensus and work with colleagues across the political spectrum to build on the engagement already undertaken by my predecessor, Rosanna Cunningham, and I will bring forward some thought on that in the coming weeks. But in closing, I would like to once again thank Alex uh, Johnson for bringing this debate today. Uh, reassure him and other colleagues that I am committed to working with all those who have something to offer in responding to this challenge. I am encouraged by the progress that is being uh, made in local areas such as across Tayside, but we must increase the capacity of all of Scotland uh, to respond, with local ADPs working with community planning partners and nationally commissioned organisations to tackle drugs misuse and support delivery of the, the road to recovery. You have my commitment and uh, the commitment of this government to continue to intervene at a national level to create the best conditions uh, to, for NPS to be tackled and to having an open door to work with colleagues across the chamber to tackle the challenge posed by public health uh, to public health and communities' well-being uh, represented by NPS. And I thank you for your time today and thank you for the valuable contributions that all have made to this debate. And thank you, Minister. And I now close this meeting of Parliament.